Thank you all uh, very much for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Fishman. I'm a counterterrorism research fellow here at the New America Foundation. Uh, and, and I really appreciate you, you taking the time to be here. Um, usually my, my sort of prerogative hosting something like this as the moderator is, is to just sort of introduce the issue and get out of the way as quickly as possible uh, for the folks that uh, we have speaking. Today I'm going to give a little bit more of an introduction uh, in large part because of the sort of sensitive nature of this issue and I think we need to frame it uh, appropriately. Um, part of the, the sort of question that I have about this entire topic is whether we can have a responsible conversation about Al-Qaeda and its interactions with any state in a responsible way in Washington. Um, I think in a lot of ways we haven't done that on this issue. Um, you sort of get two sides on this question. Um, I see in, in the political debate and the discourse in Washington, on the one side we see sort of the, the assertion that Al-Qaeda and Iran and perhaps Hamas and Hezbollah are all part of one large sort of collective. Uh, and I think that that notion um, is fundamentally false. And I, and I hope that we, are, we don't sort of drift into a discussion that looks uh, at these issues in that very simplistic way today. Um, but on the other hand, there's also uh, a tendency to sort of put blinders on to the fact that groups like Al-Qaeda and Iran uh, are very pragmatic. Um, they are serious groups trying to accomplish things in the real world. Um, and as part of those efforts, um, they oftentimes cut deals um, and, and create arrangements with folks that you might not expect. Um, we shouldn't also fall down the rabbit hole of assuming that there is no relationship between these entities because Al-Qaeda famously is a Sunni group, Sunni jihadi organization, and Iran has a, a Shia ideology. That uh, is overly simplistic as well. So what we really want to do today is look somewhere in the middle and try to distinguish the in intelligence question of what is this relationship from the various policy questions associated with both Al-Qaeda and Iran. And I hope we can do that, and I hope uh, uh, that later on in the audience you, you guys help us and, and have that conversation with us. Okay, the, the immediate impetus for this event uh, really was raised in last December with a court decision in New York that essentially found that uh, Iran and various uh, constituent agencies, uh, Hezbollah, the Taliban, and Al-Qaeda were liable for 9-11. Um, and so we've got a, a, a situation that is not all that abnormal where uh, there has been an effort to, uh, to um, essentially get uh, financial uh, remuneration from Iran because it was responsible in part for the 9-11 attack, liable for the 9-11 attack. Now what's interesting about this is that the legal standard in that decision was actually very low. Um, there is no assertion that Iran necessarily knew of the attack, simply that they provided material support for unlawful deaths associated. And, and Dan, I think, is, is far better situated than I to talk about that situation, and we'll go into it. But what that court case does is it raises an issue, um, which is what is this relationship with, between Al-Qaeda and Iran? And similarly, late last year, uh, the Treasury Department designated both entities of the Iranian government, but also several uh, previously unnamed Al-Qaeda operatives that are, um, according to Treasury, working in Iran and collaborating with elements of the Iranian government. I uh, use collaborating and associating with, a lot, I, don't, I don't know the right word here, and that's part of the debate that we're going to have. Um, but this is the question in front of us. Um, obviously, there are potential policy implications that fall out of this discussion, but I hope that we hold those for after a a really a better understanding from Dan and from Afshan into both how Al-Qaeda is operating and how the Iranian regime uh, thinks about these kinds of issues. Um, so with that, I'll just introduce um, Dan Byman. Dan is a professor at Georgetown. Uh, up until between 2005 and 2010, he directed the security studies program there. And he's also the research director at the Saban Center at the Brookings Institute. And thank you very much for being here. And then Afshan Ostavar uh, is a research analyst at the Center for Naval Analysis, wrote his dissertation at Michigan on uh, the IRGC and the Quds Force and essentially Iran's uh, ability to operate outside the country um, 
I guess is one way to put it. So um, with that, uh, I'll pass it to Dan. Dan, you've got 15 minutes or so, and, and then we'll go to Afshan, and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, thank you, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, as Brian mentioned it in his remarks, uh, this particular topic tends to get the worst from all sides. That this is something that is either there is an unholy alliance that's kind of like the James Bond equivalent of Spectre, where you know, all these different enemies are in one room plotting against the United States. Um, or on the other hand, an attempt to really whitewash what I feel is quite nasty behavior of the Iranian regime. And to me, this relationship always was and is today or an alliance of convenience. Uh, but at the same time, there, there is a there there. There is cooperation. There are things going on that are, are worthy of attention. Uh, I'll talk of kind of uh, the pre-9-11 era, immediately after 9-11, and then today in saying this up. Uh, before 9-11, there was an array of, of cooperation at different times. And, and the first question in some ways is why? Uh, Al-Qaeda during this period, especially early on, especially when it's in Sudan until 1996, is really desperate for training. That it has training facilities in Sudan, but it's not something that's done on an extensive level. Its instructors are not particularly skilled. They don't have that many. Um, and the Iranians, especially by Hezbollah, are quite good at this. And uh, arguably Hezbollah even today is pound for pound the world's most capable terrorist group. And so their ability to train is quite extensive. And during this time period, Iran is trying to bridge the Shia-Sunni divide. It sees himself, itself as a revolutionary leader, leader of an anti-American position, and representing Muslims, not Shia. And that message has actually never quite gelled. But nevertheless, it's, that ambition was there. And at the same time in Sudan, uh, early on you had the leadership of Sudan really inviting every Sunni jihadist group you could imagine to hang out in a cartoon for a while. This changes over time, but there's an initial um, kind of almost you know, Casablanca sort of sense of all these people gathering under one roof who are, are actually quite different. And they're willing to facilitate the entry of the Iranians. And we have uh, some training done uh, largely via Hezbollah of Al-Qaeda operatives during this time. Um, something to remember is during this early period, um, Al-Qaeda is not really Al-Qaeda. It's a relatively small group. It's not terribly strong. Its funding is limited. It's, it's there. It's present. But it's not the dominant group it later becomes towards the end of the decade. Um, and they have a common enemy. And this is fairly obvious. But we have statements uh, from al-Qaeda leaders. Uh, Zawahiri says in Asahab that um, Iran and al-Qaeda in the past worked together on, quote, confronting the American-led Zionist Crusader Alliance. So you know, we're fairly openly admitting there is at least some cooperation. And really, Al-Qaeda takes a while to focus on the United States. But by 1993, 1994, that shift is really there. And of course, during this time period, the Iran and the United States are very focused on each other as enemies. Um, and while Al-Qaeda, as uh, was mentioned in Brian's intro remarks, is a, a hostile to the Shia in general, especially many of their supporters, uh, their general view is we have differences with the Shia community, but we have bigger fish to fry. And we'll handle that after we've taken care of uh, bigger enemies. Um, and remember also, and um, um, Afshan's going to talk about this further, kind of the pragmatism of the Iranians. Uh, during the height of the revolutionary fervor, when Khomeini is leading the country, they work with the Israelis. Okay? I mean, so this is not a, a crazy case of, oh my god, the Iranians would never work with someone they don't like. Right? Uh, this is a, a regime that's quite willing to work with people it sees as avowed enemies. Um, all that said, the relationship is not particularly close. There are overtures that don't seem to go anywhere. The training is there, but it's not that extensive. And certainly by the end of the decade, you wouldn't say that um, what Iran is doing is something that is overwhelmingly important to the military effort. Uh, probably the most significant help during this period is with travel. And this really happens after 1996 when al-Qaeda relocates back to Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, the 9-11 Commission found that um, somewhere between 8 and 10 of the 14 Saudi hijackers who provided muscle for the attack um, transited Iran in the year before the attack. And so they're going back and forth. And there are some reports of travel facilitation done in Beirut, presumably through Hezbollah as well. Um, and it's useful for al-Qaeda not to have visa stamped 
uh, for members to be able to have clean passports as they go to and from. Um, but also important is it's useful to have an alternative route beyond Pakistan. Uh, you know, frankly, the United States faces this today logistically, right? Which is it wants to get stuff to Afghanistan, and a lot goes through Pakistan. But Pakistan is a difficult partner in a variety of ways. And what happened with Pakistan for Al Qaeda is we saw in the 1990s um, sometimes cooperation, sometimes cracking down. So having you, uh, you want redundancy in your logistics and travel system. Um, for the Iranians, this travel assistance is usually done via deliberate neglect. So not stamping visas, not getting in the way. And in some ways, this sounds minor, but this is tremendously important for terrorist groups, which is before 9-11, the way this organization was so successful was really staying below the radar screens of government intelligence services. And at times, governments deciding not to take action. And you know, in a way, one of the big post-9-11 challenges is trying to get governments around the world to take action. And with the Iranians, it's not so much kind of an obvious direct support in terms of huge sacks of cash or something like that. It's more deliberate choices made to not facilitate. Um, right after 9-11, there's a window. Uh, you have a couple things going on at once. Uh, one is Iran is very anti-Taliban. So when the United States comes in, when the Northern Alliance comes in, from Tehran's point of view, this is largely seen as a positive development. Uh, there was a brief time period, uh, especially before the president's uh, kind of axis of evil, the talk of Iran as part of the a problem, when there seemed like there might be an American-Iranian rapprochement. And so there's a little hope going on there. Um, and at the same time, Al-Qaeda, to its surprise, is routed from Afghanistan. And there's considerable pressure placed on it in Pakistan. Not again 100%, but considerable. So a branch of the organization seems to go to Iran. And there the Iranians hold them. And it's not a firm, you know, put him in jail, try him sort of thing. But at the same time, it's not a let him run around the country completely free and do whatever they want. And this is more a judgment on my part rather than evidence based But my sense of what the Iranians were thinking at this time was, uh, first of all, they believe the United States is supporting, or at least working with, um, an anti-Iranian terrorist group, the Mujahideen e Khalq, and that's based in Iraq next door. And the United States invades Iraq and, in fact, takes possession, if you will, of uh, some of these camps. And they want a bargaining chip. So you trade you know, the people we want for the people you want. Um, also, they want, lack of a better word, hostages for good behavior. And we have correspondence that was published, uh, publicized later uh, between Zawahiri and Zarqawi in Iraq, where they're saying, you know, look, we have to be careful with the Iranians because a number of our brothers are in Iran, and they hold them, and we have to be careful with this. Um, but at this time, there's also Iranian cooperation. You know, again, we have a Zawahiri statement saying, you know, all of a sudden we discovered Iran collaborating with America, and Iran stabbed the Muslim community in its back. So there's a, a real sense of anger. And we have this series of interviews from a, a relatively senior lieutenant, Saif al Adel, who notes that in 2002, about 70% of their plans in Iran were aborted by the Iranian regime. Um, and uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who was one of the U.S. indirect negotiators with the Iranians, uh, says that the, the surrender of al-Qaeda figures in Iran was one of the things on the table during negotiations. So it's, it's clearly a live issue. And there's something, frankly, I've never been able to get to the bottom of, which is the possible Iranian role in terrorist attacks in Saudi Arabia in 2003. Uh, Saif al Adel, who I mentioned, was, some people believe, supposed to be the leader of al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula. And there's one report where basically his bags show up in Saudi Arabia, but he's still stuck in Iran, which for those of you who have done modern air travel, especially in the Middle East, is not terribly surprising. And this sort of issue is a real question of, is it the Iranians were holding him back? There are other reports that he's making, that uh, al-Qaeda figures are making phone calls, helping orchestrate things in Saudi Arabia. And uh, I don't know, but this issue flares up, and I haven't been able to see subsequent things. But there has been subsequent Saudi pressure on the Iranians that meant that Iran certainly tightened house arrest after this period. Um, today, uh, the Department of State at least talks about there being a limited safe haven in Iran, that Iran, Iran won't bring these individuals to justice. 
It won't identify who's there. So there are reports of individuals here and there, but it's not a consistent um, list of who's, who's present. Um, and that they don't fully curtail their activities. Uh, for the most part, it seems that the leaders do not do significant operations from Iran, that the kind of day-to-day -day orchestration that may have happened in the past isn't happening. Um, but very important is family members are safe. Uh, and this is something that's often neglected when people think about terrorist groups, because there's often this image of this small, hardcore of people who commit themselves fully to an organization. But that's often not the case. Uh, terrorist groups have families too. And one of the most effective means of gathering intelligence on a terrorist organization is to put pressure on their families. And in Iran, you have a degree of safety for a number of families, which is very important because it's hard for al-Qaeda to find uh, that equivalent haven today. It's hunted around the globe. And we can talk about Yemen, we can talk about Pakistan, talk about all these issues. But having a place where there's more of an assured um, uh, assurance that the government is not actively hunting the families uh, is certainly beneficial to them. Um, why all this today? Um, a couple things. Um, again, there's a shared enemy. Uh, certainly a sense of the United States as a shared enemy. Uh, again, in my view, from the Iranian point of view, the having some ties to the uh, Sunni Islamist community is, is seen as beneficial. Um, also, and this is a more kind of jargony sort of explanation, uh, this relationship is useful for signaling. It's useful for um, Iran to be able to send messages. So when Iran's angry at the United States, magically an al-Qaeda figure happens to escape. You know, and that signaling is, is very successful. Uh, Syria did that recently as well, where you know, a senior Syrian jihadist, Abu Musab al-Suri, escaped as pressure heated up on the Syrian regime. Uh, but a big one to me is that the Iranian regime always likes options. And this is true, I think, of weak countries in general. It's also true of, frankly, countries more than the United States. I think this is a relative weakness of the United States, which is Iran recognizes that what it needs today in its foreign policy may be different from what it needs two years from now. And so it's cultivating individuals who may be hostile to it, recognizing the landscape may change. So what we saw in Iraq, what we've seen elsewhere is Iran has funded and armed and trained groups that happen to be shooting each other. And it does try to reduce, avoid that, but that's not a contradiction in Iranian foreign policy. That's the recognition that, you know, what's the world going to look like in five years? You know, I certainly don't know. And I think they're more willing to try to create assets around the world, just as flexibility as well. Uh, some problems, some very important ones. Uh, one is, of course, there are different views on what constitutes Islam and Islamic government. And this stems from the Shia-Sunni divide. It stems from the nature of the Iranian religious system. But there's a very strong ideological difference uh, in, on this very basic question. Uh, you also have some Sunni uh, terrorist groups uh, conducting attacks in Iran. And needless to say, the Iranian government is, is very aware of this. Uh, and in Iraq, I think there was some commonality in fighting the United States, even though they backed different horses. But with the departure of US forces, the basic question of what should Iraq look like, uh, which parties should be dominant, how should the system work, uh, to me that's really a source of potential division within this. Um, I'll, I'll close uh, simply saying something very obvious, which is uh, this is an extremely opaque subject. right? Um, I suspect some of what I've told you is wrong, I just don't know which part. And as an analyst, that's extremely frustrating. Um, and there, but there are reasons for this. right? Uh, the Iranians are very good at operational security. This is a country that has mastered it over the years. Um, and to me, not surprisingly, their ability to deflect information to hide it is, is pretty considerable. Um, also for Iran, uh, their people don't like Al Qaeda. And they also don't want to bring on additional wrath from the United States or other Saudi Arabia or other enemies of Al Qaeda. So there's a real cost politically, diplomatically to Iran if it's seen as deeply in bed with these guys. Um, ironically, that's true on the other side of the fence as well, where for Al Qaeda, uh, its funders hate Iran. You know that you know there's a real debate in some of these circles of, you know, really is it best to kill an American, a Jew, or a Shia, right? And that's a very live debate. And so the idea that the Iranians are getting in bed, or the Al Qaeda is getting in bed with one of those very negative communities, um, is quite dangerous just from an organizational point of view, uh, associating themselves. Um, and especially some of their lower level fighters really feel this sense as well.
And as a result, both sides have a very strong reason to try to limit information on this relationship. And that's so, you know, to quote a, a very famous man uh, in a very different context, you know, the absence of evidence is not always uh, evidence of absence. And here we have scraps of evidence here or there. We have logics we can apply. But there's a lot that can slip through the cracks when that's your data. That's your data. And so this is something that I hope gets more attention because as it gets more attention, I think more information may come out. But um, it's still something I think we need to watch closely. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Afshan. Uh, well, I just wanted to thank Brian and Dan and New America Foundation for having us over here. And thank you all for taking time out of such a beautiful day to uh, attend a talk on Iraq, or Iran and uh, Al Qaeda. Freudian slip there, yeah. perhaps. Um, uh, but I want to expand on some of the things that Dan was saying, especially towards the end of his talk, on where Al-Qaeda may or may not fit within Iran's own sort of strategic calculus vis-a-vis -vis the United States, the region, Al-Qaeda itself, Pakistan, uh, and other factors. Uh, and I want to do that by explaining a little bit sort of the history of the Islamic Republic's relationship with outside actors. Sometimes we call them proxies, sometimes we call them terrorist groups, sometimes we call them insurgents. Um, I will probably slip into the term proxy myself, although I think that's sort of a, uh, a poor term because it, it tends to suggest a, a stronger relationship between the two um, uh, than actually exists. But uh, for the lack of better terminology, uh, we'll see where we get. Uh, first of all, Iran's first foray into working with outside groups happened very early uh, within the revolution. The revolution itself was what I call sort of a third worldist revolution. It was part of the awakening of the third world that you saw all over the place, not just in the Muslim world, but also places like Vietnam, Cuba, Latin America, etc. The Iranians were of the same mind. And for that, uh, they were inspired by an anti-imperialist agenda. They viewed the United States and other powers, uh, especially Britain, as the problem in the world, and they had a real sort of nativistic um, response to it. But part of that also uh, believed that Iran itself, after achieving a revolution, had sort of the, the duty to help other groups inspire their own change in their own locations. Um, and initially in the revolution, this included groups far and wide, African Americans, blacks in South Africa, uh, Eritreans, Bahrainis, Kuwaitis, Afghanis, everybody. Um, but very quickly, the Iranians realized, one, that their government was not necessarily um, uh, fond of the idea of messing around in all of these different places. And two, Iran really didn't have the wherewithal to get anything done in these places. One, it was a poor country, it was a fractured country, it was a country that was uh, in 1980, fighting its own war against Saddam Hussein uh, that lasted for eight years. And three, it wasn't entirely unified in what it wanted to do and how it wanted to do it. Uh, the real radicals in the 80s uh, actually lost favor in the Islamic Republic. Um, they are now the reformists, uh, and, uh, and they're sort of... Uh, supporters, they lost out because the conservatives in Iran actually sort of gained the upper hand. And when the conservatives gained the upper hand, Iran's foreign policy really took a step back from the ideological um, and politicized fashion that it had been sort of run through the 80s and took on a far more pragmatic um, sort of Iran first, uh, in some ways sort of strategic and, and deterrent focused foreign policy. Um, and Iran's first and foremost relationship that it cultivated in the 80s was with Lebanese Hezbollah, a group that it in some part helped uh, uh, create and helped establish out of various other uh, smaller uh, Islamic groups in southern and eastern Lebanon. Um, but the relationships that, that forged Hezbollah were actually established in the 70s, and even earlier than that in the late 60s, by various Iranian activists and clergy who had lived in Lebanon uh, off and on during the 70s, uh, and uh, to some extent, had some activists had trained uh, with the PLO and Fatah during that time. And it was during this time that they had made the relationships uh, for what became Hezbollah. This becomes important uh, later on. 
Two, the second most important groups that, they, uh, that Iran was able to cultivate uh, were Iraqi groups. Uh, and this came as a direct result of the Iran-Iraq war and were focused mostly on Iraqi refugees uh, and political dissidents who had left Iraq and sided with the Iranians uh, in that war. Uh, the most famous was the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq uh, and its military component, the Badr Corps, the Badr Organization, as it's now called. Uh, the Badr Organization and Skiri, uh, the Supreme Council, were also groups that were trained by Iran's Revolutionary Guards and, and security services were in part armed by uh, the Iranian security services and operated alongside Iranian security services up until the, in, the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003 when most of these guys were able to go back and we know the history of what they were able to do since then. They were able to become in some sense the heart of, of Maliki's security services over time. Now, when we talk about Iran's success in its proxy support or the support of its outside or extraterritorial operations, we tend to really think about Hezbollah and what happened in Iraq uh, over the last decade. And the reasons why these were so successful were one, they were dealing with Shia Muslims um, who uh, had forged relationships with Iran's own cler clergy. So they had sort of similar networks, uh, similar uh, religious networks, uh, and they had shared sort of uh, a long history of, of communicating, uh, of similar activism and whatnot. Um, but two, they also had a long time to cultivate these relationships. I mean, if you think about it, the reason why the Iraqis were so successful, uh, the Shia-sponsored Iraqis, uh, the Iranian-sponsored Shia Iraqis were so successful in, uh, after the, the U.S. invasion was because they had a long time with the Iranians, uh, working with the Iranians, learning Persian, training with the Iranians. Those relationships uh, were so tight that it's, it's hard to sort of um, extract them and, and look at them sort of in a vacuum. I mean, really, Iran was successful because it was basically Iranians going to Iraq and able to join the security services in a certain way. Uh, what Iran did with Hezbollah was very similar. It was based on decades of relationship building. Where Iran failed was in every other respect for the most part. Uh, most significantly, uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan was also an area in the 80s which had a, had a war between the Soviets and, and the Mujahideen. Uh, the Iranians were very interested in getting involved, uh, tried very hard to find groups and individuals that it could work with, w was, were successful to an extent in creating small uh, groups among the Hazars, among the Tajiks, uh, which, with, which with it could work, but ultimately completely failed to gain traction among the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen had better suitors. They had the Saudis, they had the Pakistanis, they had the Americans, uh, and the Iranians had very little to offer. Secondly, the Afghanis, even though a lot of them spoke Persian, were not Shia, did not share, for the, with the exception of the Hazaras, did not share for the most part the, the clerical networks that had uh, really laid the foundation for the Iraqi and the, the Lebanese experience. Um, and thirdly, just were not as interested in what Iran had to offer because it again, uh, wasn't that significant. Uh, so Iran wasn't able to get anything done in Afghanistan virtually uh, at all uh, until, let's say, the last six, seven years when Iran has found uh, an ability to uh, funnel weapons, uh, especially explosives, to uh, various Taliban-linked groups uh, in Afghanistan that have been used against U.S. forces. Um, but still, these are, uh, as, as uh, Dan put it, relationships of convenience. Uh, the Taliban uh, that Iran supports and, and other actors that Iran supports uh, are not allied uh, with the Iranians. They simply are able to take what the Iranians want to offer uh, and the Iranians are happy to do that so long as they can continue to put pressure on U.S. forces there um, as part of a larger strategic agenda which is deterring a U.S. attack against Iran, which is, in my opinion, Iran's sole focus uh, 
uh, and has been for at least the last 20 years, if not since the revolution. Iran is absolutely paranoid that the United States uh, will work to overthrow the regime, either militarily or through domestic activities, that is by supporting uh, pro-democracy groups, by supporting ethnic insurgencies. Um, and much of their decision making is driven by this idea of preventing the United States from going forward in this. One, by giving the US reasons not to, by threatening US forces uh, in the Persian Gulf, in Iraq, or in Afghanistan, or elsewhere. Uh, and two, by playing another game diplomatically by having certain assets um, that are of interest to the United States, uh, which is where I think Al-Qaeda fits in. Uh, Al-Qaeda is, uh, in some ways, um, a double-edged sword to the Iranians, uh, or maybe a, a three-edged sword, if you can think of it that way. I mean, on the one hand, Al-Qaeda is absolutely uh, and inherently anti-Shia. Um, uh, I keep wanting to call you Bruce. Uh, <laughs> Dan uh, spoke, I think, eloquently about the problems uh, within Al-Qaeda and within Al-Qaeda supporters regarding how much the Shia are an enemy. Uh, are they a greater enemy or a lesser enemy than the United States uh, or Jews? Are they, uh, are they an enemy that, that they should be targeting now or later? Uh, within the jihadist literature, the, the Shia are a problem, if not, if not the biggest problem, because they are sort of the, the wolf in sheep's clothing. They are, they are sort of destroying Islam from the inside, um, as they would put it. So on the one hand, Iran knows this. Uh, and Iran has great fears of what they call Wahhabis uh, and what we call jihadists, but that is uh, militant Sunni fundamentalists. Uh, Iran has... Sunni minority communities that live mostly on the margins of the Iranian state. You have Kurds, Turkmen, uh, and uh, Baluchis, and you also have Sunni Arabs uh, near the border with Iraq. And Iran is terrified uh, of these communities rebelling against the state, but, but especially doing so along religious lines, um, uh, which uh, has been taking place, and has been taking place since the revolution itself. Uh, and took place actually before the revolution in some ways. Uh, so Iran is, is worried that Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-linked groups could stir up trouble within its own borders. Um, two, they are worried uh, about the United States uh, and what the United States might do. Um, uh, and I forget what my third point was, but at any rate, those, <laughs> those, are, those are two points there. They're actually also worried about P Pakistan. Uh, that's not my original thought, but there's your, your third <laughs> point. Um, Pakistan also pro poses a problem to Iran. Uh, they have tense relations, um, and Pakistan uh, has supported uh, the Baluch insurgency, at least uh, in Iran's uh, southeast, um, even if they don't admit it, and Iran doesn't necessarily blame them, but uh, every significant figure that Iran has arrested has been uh, arrested in Pakistan or given to them by the Pakistani authorities. So, you know, there's, there's uh, some logic there that Iranians are able to deduce that the Pakistanis are in some way uh, allowing this thing to go on. Uh, but Al-Qaeda affords Iran, theoretically at least, I'm not speaking as an Iranian decision maker, but the way that I read it as an analyst is that Iran sees in Al-Qaeda, one, a convenient hostage for both the United States and for Al-Qaeda itself, uh, as Dan already stated. Uh, the United States, they know, want these people and tried uh, in vain to get them uh, in earlier discussions um, in 2003. Um, or was it 2001? Um, multiple times. Right? Multiple so, times, right. right. Um, but two, uh, they also know that Al-Qaeda uh, is obviously willing to target Iran and Iranians as they saw, uh, or Shia in general, as they saw in Iraq. So holding hostages, holding family members makes sense just from sort of a hostage standpoint. Now in terms of a, a proxy standpoint, you know, what could Al-Qaeda do for Iran? What would Al-Qaeda do for Iran? And does Iran even want Al-Qaeda to do anything for it? Um, in my opinion, probably not, because if Al-Qaeda were to attack the United States, say, 
again? And were the United States able to link that back to uh, one of the al-Qaeda members in Iran? Iran has two very clear examples on either side of it to know that the US would likely take military action against that. Um, and that is something, despite its bravado and despite its belligerence, that Iran really does not want. It does not want a US military attack. However, if Iran can play this game and allow the idea of Iran supporting al-Qaeda to attack the United States, if the United States were to attack Iran uh, or its nuclear facilities, this may be, to the Iranians, uh, a threat that they could make subtly, even just by signaling, um, uh, in order to ward off or at least give some trepidation uh, to, to American military planners uh, that such an attack could have these adverse effects. Um, uh, thirdly, Iran just likes to play this game of having multiple cards to play. Uh, you have uh, you have other U.S. hostages in Iran right now, probably in Iran. Uh, the former FBI agent, I, I forget his name, uh, who was kidnapped from Quiche Island several years ago. Uh, you also have uh, the Iranian-American military contractor uh, that was tried for espionage in Iran, sentenced to death, and that was reversed. Um, uh, you had the hikers uh, before that. Uh, Iran has these cards to play, and it plays them uh, when it can. Uh, and I think it only gets rid of them when it views that these hostages uh, are spent force, or that it could actually get something out of them. And, and as we saw with the hostage uh, crisis, not uh, the hostage crisis that everybody's thinking of, but the, the hostages that were taken from Beirut in the 80s, uh, they can last a long time. You know, they don't need to make these decisions very very quickly. Uh, they can hold on to these guys indefinitely. And so if, if Iran helps uh, facilitate some money to Al-Qaeda Central, helps some people pass through its borders, it's gaining some goodwill with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda promises not to attack Iran, not to fund the Baluch uh, in, uh, in the southeast. This may be a good enough deal for the Iranians to allow them to play out and to continue to hold this card. But I would suggest that if Iran were to get its grand bargain with the United States, which is what it wants, it would gladly turn over these guys. Uh, I, I don't think without hesitation. Uh, it's never going to get that grand bargain, so it's sort of a moot point. Um, but I think that's what they're all hoping for. And finally, I'll, I just want to end with one comment, uh, which is how Iran perceives its own security right now and the, the use of of terrorist groups and uh, proxies uh, against Iran itself. Uh, as Dan stated, the Mojahedin al-Khalq, uh, which are Iran's al-Qaeda, uh, if I can put it that way, um, uh, have been in Iraq uh, since the late 80s uh, and are still in Iraq now. Um, Iran blames nearly all domestic violence uh, and upheaval against the Mujahideen in one way or another. They're always part of the, the list of operators in Iran. Whether they are or not, it doesn't really matter. The Iranians see them that way. Um, the recent assassinations of Iranian scientists, for instance, are something that, that the Iranians uh, have pointed to as the Mujahideen being involved. And as uh, uh, if there's any truth to the recent reports that were leaked to NBC News, um, that the Israelis were working with the Mujahideen al-Khalq to to, uh, uh, to, to, to do these assassinations, which who knows if that's true or not, I don't know. Uh, but for the Iranians, it might as well be true. I mean, if the American press is saying it, the Iranians will just point and say, you see, NBC News is saying it. If Dan Rather believes it, then, then why not? Uh, I know Dan Rather's not with NBC News anymore. Um, secondly, you have Jondala in the southeast, uh, which may be a spent force uh, on its own since Iran has been able to kill uh, its leaders. But there was also a report in foreign policy which, again, like the NBC News report, uh, cited unnamed American intelligence sources that said that Israeli Mossad was working with Jondala, uh, supporting them, funding them, whatsoever. So from Iran's perspective, 
they are already being targeted by terrorist organizations supported by the West. So, you know, if it's okay for them to do it, why shouldn't it be okay for Iran? And Iran is this type of thinker. If you see Ahmadinejad give any speech, all of his speeches are, well, you do this stuff, so why can't we do this stuff? That's the case with the nuclear program, that's the case with international relations, that's the case with the economies. He will, their logic is, is always framed in that way. And so I think for them, it's really not as problematic as we see it. The real danger for them is getting in bed too much with Al-Qaeda that it becomes uh, a reason for the US to invade or to attack Iran. OK, thank you very much. That was great. Um, I'm going to use the moderator's prerogative to ask a couple of questions before we, before we go to the audience. But you know, one question that I think this raises is obviously the, you know, we are having this conversation at a sort of unique moment. It's a moment of heightened tension with Iran, open discussion of the possibility of either an Israeli or even an American attack on Iran. Um, there's lots of advocates around town that say that should be the case. Um, how do we place this conversation in a conversation about Al-Qaeda in Iran <coughs> Um, next to, or I don't know, I don't know if I want to say within, but in that context, and, and and what I mean is that on the one hand, this is obviously uh, a disturbing relationship, right? Al Qaeda has very rightly been uh, the, the a focus of American foreign policy for the last decade. Um, anybody that supports Al Qaeda is uh, obviously seen with a lot of suspicion, um, but on the other hand. This also portrays the Iranian regime in a more pragmatic light to a certain extent. This isn't the sort of ideologically driven regime. You're talking about a relationship with Al Qaeda that is, that is driven by pragmatism and sort of the enemy, enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of uh, framework. Does that shed any light on how we should think about their conceptualization of this tension with the United States and the West more generally now? I'll, I'll take uh, yeah. first crack. Um, you know, there's, this is a, a good news or a bad news story, depending on how you want to spin it. Uh, it does show the enmity is quite real, and to me stems from a variety of sources. This is a very serious thing, frankly, to get in bed with these guys, and, and, and should be treated as such. Uh, but the constraints are also real, as we've seen on the relationship. Uh, one reason people have raised for concern about the Iranian nuclear program is the possibility it would be transferred to terrorist groups. And the re relationship with the Lebanese Hezbollah is mentioned in this context, uh, and I would think Al-Qaeda. And um, Al-Qaeda is of particular concern because unlike Hezbollah, I think it actually wants a nuclear weapon. It's never been particularly close to getting one, but you know, unusually for a terrorist group, it, it has that objective. Uh, the point here, though, would be that the constraints, the suspicions mean transfer is not likely. And in fact, the the analogy I always say is Iran has had chemical weapons for over 30 years. And got that right? Yeah. Um, uh, since the late 80s. Uh, my math is uh, fuzzy in my mind right now. And uh, hasn't transferred them to a terrorist group. So a nuclear weapon is obviously a quantum leap uh, from chemical weapons. Uh, yet even there, we're seeing cautious on the chem side. Um, and the pragmatism does suggest deterrence, right? And it doesn't mean deterrence is necessarily easy. Uh, with Iran tied to groups like this, it suggests risk-taking. And that makes deterrence harder, but not crazy risk-taking, not irrationality. It suggests that they're pushing the envelope but not ripping up the envelope. And so that has implications for deterrence. Uh, but the hardest thing for me, and something I don't know in, the, in my own mind in the end, is um, given the importance of the nuclear issue, given the attention it's gotten from the policy community, given the diplomacy devoted to it, given the economic pressure devoted to it, um, what do you do about Al-Qaeda on top of that is really hard because you're trying 100% on an issue of great importance. And then if someone says, oh, by the way, there's this other issue, we should do more about that. Uh, I can nod my head and say, sure, but I don't know what you add that you're not already trying very aggressively to do on the nuclear issue. And so to me, the, the policy question of what to do next uh, is actually quite confused because you're trying very hard on another issue that I think most people would say is of greater importance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think it's, it's troubling, it's problematic. Um, I don't think it's a danger to the U.S., at least immediately. Uh, 
and we have bigger fish to fry with Iran as is. And I think if treated in the best case sort of diplomatic solution with Iran, I think this al-Qaeda relationship could be settled pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't think that that diplomatic solution is at least close. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know what it would take to get there. Um, uh, but I think the problem really just becomes, OK, what happens if the diplomatic solution doesn't work? If we do end up going uh, to war with Iran, or at least attacking Iran, then it's something that the US does have to consider. Right. Because how Iran responds from there is unknown. So one of the, one of the interesting elements here, though, is that raising this issue for the administ US administration is also a form of signaling. You know, we've seen one of the things that allows us to have this conversation is the Treasury Department's designations of various entities that draws this connection. That's not just Treasury Department sort of stating facts. That's a, a, that's a, that's a form of signaling. Um, how should we think about, from an American perspective, using this in a way that is productive, that is measured, that sends the right signals? If, if, because I think you know, we are... We're looking in on that process right now, and, and how should we judge it, and how should we think that it should be improved down the road? Well, I, I think you have to play a very fine line, obviously, and I think that's what we're trying to do here today. Um, you can't ignore it. Uh, it's just, uh, it's important enough, and it's known. It's not, uh, it's not something that anybody's sort of, uh, there's no yellow cake here uh, in this relationship. Um, but I think the problem becomes, uh, how do you use it for signaling? You know, I mean, Iran already should know that it's engaging in risky behavior. I mean, not just with Al Qaeda, but everything it's doing. Uh, and I think for Iran, at least given sort of its perhaps um, uh, recent attempts uh, in India or Thailand, uh, or Georgia, if Iran was indeed involved in those things, which it seems they were, but I don't know. Um, I think you're seeing an Iran that is starting to feel this pressure uh, and is trying to find at least some way to let the pressure out, um, whether that's driven by hawks in Iran that want a greater say in, in what's happening, uh, or whether that's sort of the regime in general coming to a consensus that they need to respond. Uh, to aggression. I mean, in Iran's mind, they're already at war with the United States and Israel. It is uh, uh, a Cold War of sorts uh, that has hot moments, uh, but it is a war nonetheless. They view the protests in 2009 uh, as a perfect example of the U.S. sort of engaging uh, in an attempt to overthrow the regime. I mean, that's how they see it. We see it obviously very differently. Uh, but how d would the U.S. use al-Qaeda in that respect? And I think is pretty much sort of how the administration has been doing it, by putting it out there, not ignoring it. Iran knows that we know now. We're talking about it. Um, Iran obviously knows what it has meant to Iraq and Afghanistan uh, to be involved or even not involved with al-Qaeda. Um, so it would be difficult to amplify any more than that for the Iranians. I mean, I think they know what's going on. I think the problem is more domestically that the more you go down the road sort of promoting the Iran-Al-Qaeda relationship, the more you begin to at least open yourself up to accusations of parroting the same narrative that was used against Iraq, which really, I think, detracts from what you in the end would want to get across. Uh, and it attracts from actually holding Iran responsible for the things that it does, as opposed to sort of making a mockery of, of uh, any relationship that Iran and al-Qaeda might have. So I think that's the real risk, is not making too big of a deal of it, that it sounds like Colin Powell going to the UN, um, and it gets you know, thrown back in your face a, a few years later. You, you don't want this, I guess in my opinion, this is not a reason to go to war with Iran. I don't think this should be a building block 
for uh, the pathway to war with Iran. Uh, I think it's just a problem with U.S.-Iranian relations. Uh, and I think we have the same problem with other countries, perhaps Pakistan, perhaps Yemen. I don't think Iran is necessarily unique in this regard. I think what's unique is that we already have such a strained relationship with Iran that this comes, at least, is another inconvenient uh, issue. Uh, I'll add only briefly. Uh Ironically, this sort of uh, publicity uh, may actually be one of the more effective things from a policy point of view. Uh, if you accept my argument that neither Iran nor al-Qaeda has constituents that favor this, that their own people oppose it, uh, their financial backers and so on, uh, then simply bringing it to light on a regular basis, shining uh, publicity on it, makes both sides more cautious because they could lose internally. It is actually a form of pressure, unusually. Uh, for the most part, naming and shaming doesn't work on most foreign policy issues because regimes aren't necessarily trying to hide what they're doing and at times drive political benefits from it. But in this case, when the parties are trying to hide what they're doing, the name and shame function does have some value. So to me, this is you know, mildly useful. I don't want to exaggerate it, but it, it does play a role. I know that uh, Seth Jones of the uh, Rand Corporation makes this point in a recent foreign affairs piece. And, and Dan, actually, just to to plug it, has a piece in foreign policy that was published two weeks ago or something like that, looking at some of these issues. I guess now's a good time to sort of throw it up in to, to questions. Um, I don't know, Jen, do you have the, oh, Eric's got the mic. Um, so uh, what I'd like you to do is, is wait for the mic, make sure you wait for the mic, introduce yourself, name, where you're from, and Eric, why don't we start right there next to you. Alexis Abshenko representing here myself. My question is, don't you think that the United States could pursue more aggressively this chasm between Shia and Sunni? And uh, this way, uh, have, for example, um, instead of making so much focus on Iran, I think that if we would let it be, the Iran would have much more trouble with its Sunni neighbors than now. Russians, uh, according to BBC, since 2000 were asking on every official meeting, why do we care so much about Iran, let's say, not about Pakistan, which is much, in the long run, would be much bigger trouble for us than Iran. So uh, in Iraq, the same story. We could have let them, s let them s uh, t uh, figure out among themselves. Instead, we intervened and helped them to, to mitigate the conflict among them. And as a result, they turned both Shias and Sunnis against our troops. Do you think it could have been done differently? Thank you. So there was two questions there, right? One, why doesn't the US sort of play the Shi and the Sunni off of each other? That was the first question, right? And then the second part was, why didn't it work in the past? How, OK. Well, I'll tackle the first one, um, or at least attempt to, to give an answer to it. Uh, one, my own personal view is we should absolutely not engage in that. Uh, I don't think any more creating any more divisions or, or encouraging greater divisions in the Middle East is in any way good for American security or is any way good for the security of the Middle East. It may work on a real politic level uh, to some extent, but I think in the end it only ends up uh, biting us in the backside. Uh, because already you have severe divisions uh, in the Middle East between Shia and Sunni at a cultural level. Uh, and at a political level. Uh, there are areas of, of, of course, interaction and, and, uh, um, and overlap. But if you go to uh, the uh, Arab countries in the Persian Gulf, for instance, uh, and you talk to people uh, in restaurants or at cafes, if you talk to the locals, uh, the Arab locals there, uh, they already have a pretty clear cut for the most part, if I can generalize across several countries uh, at one point, uh, they already have a pretty strong opinion of Iran and of the Shia uh, that I don't think is uh, something that was created uh, outside of that. I mean, you have lasting cultural antipathy at the very least. Um, why we would want to play that up, I don't know, because it's already there. Uh, the second thing is that Iran is already very isolated. Um, uh, regionally. I mean, Iraq uh, is friendly with Iran. Uh, 
Iran interacts with Turkey and Pakistan and Turkmenistan and other countries. But when you talk about just across the Gulf with the Arab countries, although Iran interacts with them, there are severe tensions with Saudi Arabia, with the United Arab Emirates, uh, and with Kuwait and Bahrain. Uh, Qatar and Oman have, have more favorable relationships with Iran, but the relationships with the other countries are already very tense, as well as they are with Jordan and as they were with Egypt. That may be changing, I don't know. And as Iran may or may not be losing the Assad regime in Syria, it's possible that a future Syria is also going to be uh, antagonistic towards Iran. Uh, certainly the resistance, the Sunni resistance in Syria is. So I think that's already there. Uh, and I don't, think, uh, I don't think encouraging that division will help us in the long run, personally. Um, just to comment on one aspect of your question, uh, uh, to me, Pakistan actually is a much bigger issue than Iran, uh, certainly in relation to support for terrorism, but also, more importantly, on questions of stability, control of nuclear weapons, and so on. If you look at kind of high-impact scenarios and relative probabilities, to me, they're they're of much more concern in Pakistan. Uh, part of the problem with Pakistan is it's half an ally, half an enemy. And that makes for extremely difficult policy making. That when, uh, if they're on one side or another, you have a standard menu of options. When they're uh, neither or both, it's exceptionally confusing. And I, the joy of where I sit as professor and as think tank person is I can criticize whatever Pakistan policy you want to present and tell you why it won't work. Um, and I urge you to do so because I could write another op-ed on it. But it's, um, uh, in the end, you need a policy, right? But to me, that issue, that dilemma is actually much more acute for Pakistan, what to do about it, how, much, how dangerous it is, and so on, I see as much harder and deserving of much more thought than on the Iranian side. Eric, why don't you come there and then we'll work forward. Uh, yes, uh, the name is John Mueller from Ohio State and at uh, Cato Institute. Uh, 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 issue for Dan, it seems to me that uh, Dan Rumsfeld was the first person to say absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, uh, only because Hans Christian Andersen didn't think about it when he was writing The Emperor's New Clothes. Um, I'd like to ask the, the two, uh, would it be a reasonable summary of what you just said, that there is no evidence that Al-Qaeda and Iran ever had, do have now, or likely ever have in the future, any kind of relationship that is of, of really substantial significance? Uh, I, would, I would disagree with that. Uh, I think that the relationship has limited significance, is how I'd put it, which is, I think, the limited haven that uh, Al Qaeda figures have enjoyed in Iran has mattered. They are, it's a relatively small group, so having a certain percentage of the organization have some shelter has mattered. I think the transit assistance was useful having another line in out of Afghanistan, Pakistan. None of this is overwhelming. I mean, if I were kind of ranking around support among... Significant. Well, significance is a tough issue. It's significant in keeping the organization alive and able to do some degree of operations at different periods in its history. I would say it has been significant, but not overwhelmingly so. Not, um, uh, how would I put it, uh, not sufficient. Uh, and there are other countries and relationships I would place ahead of Iran on the list. Eric, why don't we come up to these two and then we'll go to the back. Yeah, my name is Lee Yang, independent TV program producer. I just wonder if you can analyze from the characteristics of uh, those uh, population or ethnic group uh, that I try to compare with the United States, if they want to target uh, somebody em employee for discrimination, maybe they can be, say, by ethnic group, but they can also target uh, whether they are weaker, like black and brown, they are divided them up, or for maybe uh, elderly group because they are alone, nobody taking care of them, or maybe by, they say, patient, Pacific Asian group, maybe their culture is different, maybe they are sort of more thinking rather than more talking. So instead of a fight, they rather to say, make some sort of resolution, talk to the employer rather than complain right away or shout right away. So I just wonder if you can talk about cultural background or characteristic of those group, Iran or Pakistan or Al-Qaeda. That's why the US policy will divide them up 
or suddenly turn down, or you take their resources away, and then we send them to jail rather than allow them to communicate to their family member or to their group leaders. They're, the divisions are quite real, and I, I see them less as cultural and more as just ideological as difference in how the world should work. Um, and however, actually playing on these successfully is an exceptionally difficult thing to do because you have countervailing pressures. You have common interests. You have a degree of necessity. And so it's the sort of thing that, that can be done through propaganda and so on. But in reality, to me, you don't expect this to work particularly well. Uh, you're often, uh, one thing that's always hard to remember is, for the most part, we're dealing with an excep exceptionally small number of individuals that are, are living under very unusual circumstances. And so these kind of big targeted efforts, often when you get down to that micro level, don't really work particularly well. So um, notionally, that idea should be in the back of the mind as people decide, uh, decide policies, the importance of culture. But in practice, I, I find it hard to apply it to this particular situation. Sure. Eric, why don't we go? Mark Katz from George Mason University. I'd like to thank both speakers for a very uh, uh, careful, nuanced uh, presentation that the Iranian Al-Qaeda relationship, it's not a grand alliance, it's not nothing, but it's a limited, pragmatic relationship. But what I found fascinating is that both of you emphasize that in many respects the Iranians are fearful of Al-Qaeda, and yet this support continues anyway. Therefore, I'm, I'm wondering, do you think that it's simply motivated by this enemy of my enemy is my friend logic, or does it involve a degree of appeasement on Iran's side? In other words, are they working, giving some support to Al-Qaeda to give Al-Qaeda and its friends a reason not to target Iran? Thank you. Uh, well, it's a good question. I'll say this up front. I have no idea. I mean, I really don't know. I don't know what they're thinking. Um, but the way that I see it uh, is it's probably a little bit of both. I mean, I don't think that Iran <clears throat> is actually afraid of Al Qaeda itself. Uh, Al Qaeda doesn't seem to have wanted to waste its time attacking Iran, for instance, as opposed to you know Europe or, or Saudi Arabia or the United States. That's not to say that Al Qaeda wouldn't, and there's been plenty of talk in jihadist forums about that. What Iran is afraid of is the larger Sunni extremist movement um, and that sort of snowballing in certain provinces uh, in its area, uh, and especially from taking hold. And that is something where if al-Qaeda is seen as influential uh, by the Iranians uh, within its own sort of communities, then, then, then al-Qaeda could be seen as a threat. So there has been suggestions that uh, the grand bargain between uh, Iran and al-Qaeda is that uh, they allow al-Qaeda a modicum of uh, these certain operatives, a modicum of, of, of uh, ability to conduct business in exchange for a promise that Iran is not going to be targeted, that Iranians are not going to be targeted. Um, I don't know if that's true. That's plausible. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Uh, but I think for Iran, uh, I would like to think that it's less about appeasement of al-Qaeda and more about having a piece of leverage over the United States, especially, but also over Saudi and Pakistan and everybody else. I mean, that's one thing that we tend to forget is that Iran has complicated relationships with everybody there, as does al-Qaeda. Uh, and for Iran to have one hand, you know, uh, in that cookie jar, gives it a seat at the table in these conversations. The same way that it's in being involved with Hamas, Hezbollah, and Islamic Jihad allows it to be at the table, uh, at least uh, in theory, with the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. Uh, they know that if they can sort of get their foot in the door, that they can gain more leverage by being part of important problems. And, uh, and so that's, that's more how I see it than appeasement, but I don't know. Dan, I've got a, I, I want to have those questions specifically for you. I'm going to read you a quote um, from the autobiography of Harun Fazl, who was al-Qaeda's emissary in East Africa for decades, um, and really one of sort of the original cadre. <clears throat> in his autobiography, he talks about Ayman al-Zawahiri, who uh, this, was, this was published in 2010, um, but he also talks about some of the his, what he calls the historical leadership 
of Al Qaeda, referring specifically to Saif al Anil. Um, and, and what he says is kind of interesting. He says, quote, uh, speaking of Zawahiri, he is called the number two man in the organization, but I've never once taken orders from, orders from Zawahiri. Although he became the deputy of the Sheikh, Osama bin Laden, after unification and followed the same management style, the number two man in the mother Al Qaeda organization is Brother Saif al Adl, after the killing of Sheikh Abu Hafs, the commander. Uh, and we do not take orders from anyone but our historical leadership. So the question, it, it's been pretty clear after the death of bin Laden, Zawahiri has really assumed this leadership role. But I'm wondering if when you have a cadre of folks that has existed, and, and Fazl talks about this in other settings where there's members of the Sharia committee, there are members of the operational committee that seem to be in Iran. Is that a, another sort of weight in the organization that potentially pulls Al Qaeda itself apart? Because they're, you know, the folks in Iran are dealing with something that's very different, a very different operational environment than the folks in Pakistan? Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is, this is why, for the most part, you don't want a global organization that's on the run. Because you're, in different countries, the organization in Yemen is different from the organization in Pakistan, it's different from the organization in Afghanistan, it's different from the organization in Iraq. And they can go in different directions, they can discredit one another, uh, strategically, it's very hard to get a coherent framework. And some of them have semi-friendly relations with governments. Some of them have quite adversarial relations with governments. And so this has always been both, to me, one of the greatest strengths and uh, biggest weaknesses of this organization, is it was able to patch together a global alliance in part by taking on lots of enemies and having a number of different organizational styles. But by taking on lots of enemies and having a number of different organizational styles, you inherently limit your strategic effectiveness. It doesn't mean you can't kill people, okay? But it does mean you actually, it's very hard to get things done. So you compare Al-Qaeda to a group like Hamas, to a group like Hezbollah. These are very effective groups. I mean, Hamas is the government of Gaza right now. It went from a relatively limited terrorist group to a government, right? We don't call it that because we don't like it, but it's a government, right? Uh, Hezbollah is part of the government of Lebanon and has a large apparatus within Lebanon. It um, is the most important political actor within Lebanon. Um, again, we don't like it, but it's very successful in a, in a political and sociological sense. Um, Al-Qaeda, because it's trying to do so much and because of its different organizational structures, never is able to quite achieve those results. And uh, they, are, they haven't resolved some fundamental issues. You know, questions we talk about, such as, what's their strategy of victory? You know, I can give you about five strategies of victory they have, but they don't go together particularly well. Um, and so they have these dilemmas. And I think the global nature, the difference in command structures really accentuates them rather than brings them together. Mm -hmm. Eric, why don't we go to the back? Hey, Jennifer Quigley-Jones from the Center for American Progress. I was actually going to build on that point. And despite the fact they're different command structures, there's been lots of talk recently about geographical global shifts with Al-Qaeda, like the Somali people, well, Kenyan, gov <laughs> Kenyan commanders have said people are moving to Yemen. There's lots of talk about Al-Qaeda moving from Iraq into Syria. And I was wondering how you saw that as affecting Al-Qaeda's presence in Iran. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't, it depends how much you believe the presence in Iran is communicating with the outside world. And my sense is they are communicating but not controlling. So information goes back and forth, but that's not the same as strategic direction. And so I think it's largely independent, but um, this is something Brian raised, which I should have mentioned before, which is there aren't that many people with the stature of having been with the organization for decades. And ironically, because a number of the people in Iran have kind of been frozen there, um, as opposed to, in most cases, killed, and in some cases arrested, you have a certain number of leaders who have a credibility and who have an organizational uh, context that others lack. But so much of what's happening, whether it's Yemen or Algeria, is being done at the affiliate level. And to me, that's really where most of the action is for this organization at the time. Um, this. Affiliate, again, is a two-edged sword uh, for the organization because it greatly expands their operational reach. Um, it means they're active in countries where they wouldn't otherwise be active. But at the same time, it's hard to have a coherent strategy that spans the globe 
as well as continues local, um, has a local context to it. Um, so I don't see the Iranian uh, cadre as having a huge role in this necessarily, but I think should they be released and become much more operationally fluid, as has happened for some, um, they, as individuals, they could certainly at least possibly play a role. Eric, one in the back, very far back. Is it on? Yes. Elaine Sereau, uh, Franklin Fellow. Uh, I thank you very much for this presentation. To go to a couple of points that you've made earlier and then th uh, throughout, so the mixed messages that Ar Iran sends to various organizations and, and countries, uh, U.S., Pakistan, uh, so on. Uh, Recently, with the, the, it's come out that the uh, there's been discussion that the wives of Osama bin Laden may have had a hand in uh, tipping the balance. Um, uh, the the senior wife Fahid Fahid I've mispronounced her name. What do you think about the issue of her release in exchange for Iranian diplomat being held? in Peshawar by the Pakistanis, and her immediate arrival in 2010 uh, at the compound in Abbottabad as a, maybe a way of helping the U.S. in, you know, by signaling that the Pakistanis obviously knew because she knew where to go right away. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I don't really. Um, the one thing I'll say is this, this rumor about there being a, a deal between al-Qaeda uh, and Iran to gain the release of an Iranian diplomat that was kidnapped uh, in Pakistan, and I believe given to the Haqqani network. Um, uh, it's possible. You know, that's what's been reported. I have no reason to doubt it, but I have no, no evidence to confirm it either. So. Um, I guess the way that I would see it is that uh, for Iran, this wife of bin Laden uh, gained Iran little by keeping her there uh, and gained Iran more by releasing her. Whether that more is getting its diplomat back or not, I don't know. Uh, but I will say that the Iranians, of course, uh, never talk about anything like that. They, they see the release of that diplomat as uh, a rescue mission undertaken by their own security forces. Um, uh, so for them, it would be a great insult to say that they did a deal with, with al-Qaeda, because that's one of the great victories of their security forces in the last couple of years. So um, I don't know, uh, to be honest, uh, but uh, it's plausible. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just say the, the wife reports are, you know, they're both vague and, as journalists say, uh, too good to confirm, right? And so uh, you know, to say I don't know, I think is, is certainly true, but I'd even go beyond this, which is I would, I would read the evidence on this one a few times over uh, before I would kind of go too far with it. Mm -hmm. I work for a couple of journalists, so I'm not going to make too many cracks about them. <laughs> um, Eric, right here with the hand up. Thank you. Uh, thank, uh, Fadi Boris Fatemi, Oxford Chart Group, and thank you very much uh, for your presentation. What I'm so curious about is with all this speculative fiction about Iran, and they get blamed for everything uh, that happens, uh, whether they're responsible or not. Why isn't there some discussion about the 15 who hijacked the planes and, uh, and uh, created 9-11? Uh, and why isn't there any discussion about the Wahhabis and the money that pours into the different extremist groups in Afghanistan, Pakistan, the madrasas, and all of that? Um, it seems like the Saudis get a, just a free pass where uh, so much of this comes right out of that selfish Wahhabi uh, kind of uh, virulent form of Islam, um, and I'd like for your comments on that. Thank you. Uh, I, I think initially the Saudis got slammed after 9-11, right? I mean, it was incredible vitriol against Saudi Arabia, uh, where in a way they were blamed for, for many, many things, uh, some of which to me were, were wrong or grossly overstated. Uh, I think the difference is that really starting in 2003, uh, Saudi Arabia became extremely aggressive going after al-Qaeda-linked organizations and has cooperated on fundraising and so on. So 
all these issues that U.S. government officials are usually the first to say, you know, a significant progress needs to be made, you know, these kind of euphemistic things. But they also say, you know, boy, Saudi Arabia has really flipped. It's really devoted energy to it. It's put high-level attention. The security services went from being lackadaisical to being very aggressive. Um, so if, if you look at the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, some of the bombing attempts from Yemen, you know, they were stopped because of Saudi intelligence. You know, that was the key, um, the key piece of information. So I think part of the reason Saudi Arabia is not um, criticized as much is that even though Saudi Arabia in a number of ways is still you know, far from perfect on this, it's seen as really moving in the right direction, while the Iranians are seen as remaining hostile. Um, so it's, uh, I think, a reflection of government intent and action, as well as the level of activity. Yeah, I would just, I mean, I, I understand the perspective. Um, uh, but I, I guess the way that I would phrase it is Iran hasn't done itself any favors. Iran has had a lot of opportunities uh, to counter this message with action. Uh, and Iran just does it, you know. Uh, I know that this is how the Iranian regime sees it as well. Um, but there are very simple, concrete steps that Iran could have taken over the last decade uh, that would have severely mitigated any narrative uh, regarding Iranian intrans intransigence, uh, Iran's support for uh, outside groups, etc. Um, but you know, you have to. It, it's fair, I think, to blame uh, U.S. media for having, let's say, a, a bias against. Um, the United States' enemies, uh, and one you know, uh, that, that favors Iran's or the United States' allies. I mean, I, I think certainly there's, there's part of that. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think you also have to fault the Iranian regime. I mean, if they wanted to correct this issue, they could do it. Afshan, I have a question for you, which draws on some of the things, actually, that Dan wrote in his foreign policy piece. He, he references the Treasury's, Treasury Department's designation of um, the Ministry of Intelligence Security, MOIS, in Iran um, as having a relation. The Treasury Department says that and, and asserts that MOIS had a relationship even with Al Qaeda in Iraq, which is perhaps the most virulently anti Shia uh, affiliate of Al Qaeda. Um, we know that other elements of the Iranian regime, most specifically IRGC, the Quds, the Quds Force, has supported various Shia militants that sort of fought on the other side of the sectarian divide in Iraq. Is there a reason to think that there are bureaucratic divisions within the Iranian regime that are driving some of these behaviors, and it's not sort of a top-down policy? Uh, I think there are reasons to believe that. Yeah. Um, I'll say, as I've said with everything, that I have no idea <laughs> what Iran is doing in this regard. I mean. The real problem with, with you know, uh, being a, an analyst of covert uh, organizations um, or opaque regimes is that they don't give you much uh, to go by. Uh, and so what I understand of Iran's government uh, intelligence uh, service, MOIS, uh, and the IRGC Special Forces, the Quds Force, um, is that for the most part, MOIS has more jurisdiction domestically than the Golds Force does. The Golds Force still is able to do things domestically, but traditionally their whole purpose has been outside of Iran's uh, borders, but that's increasingly changed in the last few years. Um, so it's not surprising to me that MOIS would, let's say, be the handlers for al-Qaeda in Iran, um, vice Golds Force. Uh, now, regarding what was happening in Iraq, I mean, it, it's surprising to think that MOIS or Gold's Force or anybody would necessarily have a relationship with Zarqawi's group um, uh, or even post Zarqawi. Uh, but I assume that comes from somewhere, and I don't know what. I can't imagine that, that the relationship was, was very strong, very consistent, or lasting. Um, but if one existed, who knows? You know, uh, it was an ugly time in 2007, 2008. You know, I, I don't know. Um, but whether these two different uh, organizations uh, have a different sort of perspective on how to handle Iran, I think that's a much tougher question to ask. Uh, I would like to think that given the very sort of public knowledge of al-Qaeda in Iran and uh, the, the sensitivity of al-Qaeda, that 
it would probably be an issue that was handled, at least in terms of strategy, if not policy, by the Supreme Leader's office. Mm -hmm. um, and it could go through various intelligence organizations uh, dealing with uh, Al-Qaeda. And whether MOIS is that service or not, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. But it, because of the consistency that Iran, uh, and the very conservative nature that Iran has with Al-Qaeda, at least that we've seen, I, I would I would venture to guess that it is a top-down decision. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yep. Um, I want to, my name is Tima. I'm from the National Iranian American Council. Um, I wanted to know what role uh, Al-Qaeda plays in Syria, um, especially recently with um, the violence between the rebels in Syria and the government and what, how that affects the relationship with Iran um, and or how Iran uh, views uh, their role in Syria. Uh, can I interject and actually ask Brian to take a first cut at this because <laughs> I think he's uh, someone who's done some very serious work on this. So I can, I, I can talk a bit about Al-Qaeda's relationship in Syria, but I, I, this is a question I wanted to ask you as well. Um, Al-Qaeda clearly uh, intends uh, to play a role in the Syrian rebellion. It's uh, public statements um, about Syria are very, very different than those about other, other sort of uh, arenas where there have been revolutions over the past um, year and a half, two years. Um, in North Africa, the message is essentially coming not only from Al Qaeda leaders specifically, but from the wider sort of jihadi intellectual community sort of say, hey, let's wait and see how this goes and sort of bide our time. In Syria, it's all hands on deck. Let's, let's get in on the game. And that's reasonable. To, I think the most reasonable explanation there is that Al-Qaeda has more operational capability in Syria than it does in some of these other places. We know, uh, you know, this is one of the few instances where we actually have reasonably good data a bit dated at this point that shows that Al-Qaeda has been able to operate networks inside of Syria. Um, and, and those networks exist. Now, many of them are not ideologically driven networks. They are networks that are criminals or smugglers. But some of those networks had relationships with elements of the Syrian security forces to, you know, and some of that is just buying people to look the other way. Um, but there's no reason that if Al-Qaeda in Iraq was able to import foreign fighters into Iraq, it's not going to be able to turn those networks around and export people into Syria. Um, there's been a number of statements now um, from on jihadi websites by organizations claiming to be jihadi networks in Syria and claiming to do suicide attacks, in fact, in Syria. Um, so the way I've been thinking about it is there's so much smoke of Al Qaeda in Syria that I don't know if, for sure if there's any fire down there, but the smoke is so thick. Uh, you almost couldn't see it anyway. Um, so with that assertion, I don't want to say that Al-Qaeda dominates the rebellion in any way. Al-Qaeda is, generally speaking, a fringe group, but it's a very dangerous fringe group uh, because, in part, it can harden the views of a regime, right? If you are going to try to uh, buy off or persuade Alawites within the Syrian military or regime that they should support the overthrow of Assad, that's much easier to do if you know that your family will survive. If you've got a deeply sectarian militant group tied to Al-Qaeda in Iraq that would kill you based on who you are and what you believe based rather than the regime that you support, just makes things worse. As to whether that will impact a relationship between Al-Qaeda and Iran, I'm not sure. Um, we know that Iran sits on the other side of this fence supporting the Assad regime, so I'll leave that question. Yeah, uh, to you both. I, I think that's basically it. I, I've never read anything in the Iranian press, for instance, that where Iran comments on Al Qaeda specifically. They may have. They may have referred to terrorists. I don't know. Um, but I think clearly Iran has a vested interest in the Assad regime continuing. Uh, if Assad falls and the resistance takes over, Iran, I think, is is the biggest loser in in uh, uh, outside of Assad and uh, that whole experience. So. Iran is going to want to continue uh, the Assad regime as long as possible. And if Al Qaeda is involved in the resistance, I think this is only you know added motivation for Iran in that regard. But whether that that complicates Iran's relationship with Al Qaeda, uh, the few guys that are in Iran right now, uh, 
uh, or that we think we're in Iran? I don't know. Um, probably a little bit, but not necessarily. Uh, Iran has been able to keep these guys um, within its borders, uh, you know, despite what Zarqawi was doing uh, in Iraq. Um, so I think they already know that, you know, these Al-Qaeda guys are bigoted against Shia, uh, and I think they're okay with that. Um, I'll only add that initially Iran's response to the Arab Spring was a sense of, you know, look, these kind of corrupt, dictatorial, pro-American, secular regimes are all crumbling. So Ben Ali, uh, Salah, uh, Mubarak, and, you know, a sense of gloating. Uh, but as it happens in Syria, it's, it's quite different, of course, because this is an Iranian ally. And it openly puts Iran against the wishes of the vast majority of the Arab people. And so there's wider anti-Iran sentiment because of this as a result. And that's true certainly in the kind of Salafi jihadist community. But it's also true well beyond that. And that's because you know, Iran's on the side of the bad guys here, and openly so. And so you're seeing you know, in Syria itself, but also elsewhere, I think, an increase in anti-Iranian sentiment. It's not necessarily you know, going to be the dominant shaper of uh, policy towards Iran in the region, but it's clearly a negative uh, in my view. So Iran's kind of doomed either way, which is either its best ally le leaves um, or you have the situation where it's on the wrong side of history. Other questions? All right, I think we'll wrap up there. Um, Dan, Afshan, I really very much appreciate you coming in and, and spending the time on a tricky subject. I think we managed most of that reasonably well. Um, and to the audience as well, thank you for the questions and thanks for being here.